Hi, everybody. See my screen? Perfect. So hi, everybody. I'm Noam, and today I'm going to talk about how we to reach end-to-end -end type safety. Um, a little bit about me. I spent the last 20 years doing enterprise projects, you know, ERP, CRM, finance, whatever. Hundreds of tables, thousands of forms. Um, I'm a coder. I'm a full-stack developer. I'm a mentor for teams. I'm a speaker, as you can see. I can speak. And I do a lot of open source work. But most importantly, I'm lazy. I think if I wasn't lazy, I wouldn't get anything done. And I'm also super error prone, which kind of dictates the tools that I choose, for example, TypeScript to protect me from errors. And a lot of my coding styles is about being lazy and reducing the number of lines of code that I can write and get wrong when I do mistakes. So why is end-to-end -end type safety important? Um, first of all, to reduce errors. As I said, I'm error prone, and I would like to reduce the chance of these errors. It allows us to improve developer velocity, develop faster, not get those spelling mistakes in our way, not get those uh, um, typing errors when you're sending a string to a Boolean or whatever. It also helps us with readability and understandability of the code, where we can actually see the parameters and see what goes on. It allows us to eliminate boilerplate code, all of those codes that we copy and paste to get data from the server, to serve data through HTTP. And I really enjoy the concept of single source of truth. In too many projects, I see logic spread around your entire code base, some of it on the form, some of it on the API layer, some of it on the service layer. I really hate that. And we all remember the fun of adding a field to an existing application. Let's add it to the database, to the service, to the route, to the front end, all across, and everybody goes nuts. It takes days to add just one field. And one last thing is validation. Keep the validation consistent. I see a lot of mistakes where I do front-end validations that does one thing and back-end validations that does something completely different. I really hate those, and that's, these are my motivations for reaching end-to-end -end type safety. So in today's talk, we're going to take a journey where we're going to start with a simple REST API route, get, put, post, delete. We're going to use a CRUD application. And then we'll refactor it to use TRPC. How many of you know what TRPC is? Okay, cool. So we'll refactor the HTTP to TRPC. We then we'll refactor that to Next.js server actions, that I'm sure that some of you heard about, and eventually refactor that to use Remalt because I am the writer of Remalt and want to show it here. And so the spec of our to-do app, let's start with that. Each, proper, each task will have an ID, title, completed, owner, and created at. Users will see either uncompleted tasks or all the tasks. A valid task must have at least three characters, so validation is kind of important. A users can only see their own tasks, but admin users can see all the tasks, and only admin users can delete. Sounds like a reasonable spec? Uh, yes, only admin users can delete. Great. So let's take a look at the code. So by the way, most of this is live coding, so bear with me. And as I said, I'm error prone, so really bear with me slowly. So on the left here, I have a copy of the spec, and let's test the application to see that it matches. We see that we have a title, a completed, an owner, and this is a variation of the created at time. And we can update tasks. The user sees uncompleted or all the tasks by clicking the show uncompleted. A valid task must have three characters, so we have validation. Users can only see their own tasks. So we can see here that the owner is Steve, and he can only see his tasks. If I sign out and sign in as Jane, who is a very known administrator, we can see that she can see both Steve's tasks and Jane's tasks. And only Jane is allowed to delete. So if we add a task, Jane will be able to delete her task. So that's our application. That's what we're going to travel our journey with. And these are the uh, definitions of it. So back to our PowerPoint, or to our presentation. So when we're talking about REST API routes, our application has an ORM. We're using Prisma in this demo, but it can just as well be Drizzle, SQLized, Type ORM, Micro ORM, whatever ORM you want to use. We're going to have a task service that will be responsible for finding, inserting, updating, and deleting tasks. And it will also handle the authorization and validation concern. We're going to have a route layer. We're going to get get, put, post, delete. And we're going to have a front end that will consume that using Fetch API. So this is the starting point of our presentation. Let's review the code. So 
Fremad Prisma, we can see here that we have the fields of our entity defined. Now, when we use, how many of you use Prisma? Okay, as far as I'm concerned, it's too many, but okay. Um, so Prisma, you define your tables in a schema in their specific own language, and based on that, it generates TypeScript types for you that makes your life a little easier from a typing perspective. So after the Prisma definition, we have the task service. Our task service gets the task type from Prisma, and then has a find task function that will find the tasks and return them. In the find task um, function, we define which users are allowed to find. And we also articulate the logic over here that says that admin users can see all the data, but non-admin users can only see their own data. Let's continue to the insert, validate authenticated user, validate data. We have a reusable function that we're going to use to do our validation. And we also select which fields will come in. So if we need to add a field, we need to add it here and in multiple other places. Update task, again authenticate, again validate, again selecting the fields, and again defining the logic of only admin users can see all the row, because we don't want non-admin users to be able to update rows that they don't have privileges for. And eventually delete task, only admin can delete the tasks. Next layer is the HTTP layer, or the route layer. So we're using Next for this demo, but it applies to pretty much anything else. We're going to have the tasks route, and in the task route, we have the get function that's responsible for returning the tasks. We can see some work here of extracting the search parameter and then getting the, whether or not the user sees only the uncompleted or sees everything. Notice this is kind of a magical string, something that I can get wrong in so many ways. I can do a lower C, I can do an A instead of an E pretty much anywhere. I can send a string instead of a boolean. It's, I can get this wrong in ways that you couldn't imagine. And let's check out the post. We have some ceremonial code to get the data out of JSON, some ceremonial code around returning an error response. Let's continue to the ID-based routes, where we have put, again, JSON and error. And of course, it all calls our service. So we have the service that we just reviewed before. And delete does pretty much the same. Again, a lot of code around errors, even for the console log over here, and stuff around that. And if we go to our front end, so in our front end, we have the fetch call to get the task that we're seeing. And if you look on the right and open the developer tools, we can see this fetch call, fetch call being executed. And again, a magical string that I can get wrong in multiple ways. We have the uh, add, where we call the validate. This is actually an important point. Even in this demo, we were able to share types between the front end and the back end. We're using the same test types that Prisma has provided, also on the front end. And even the validate task, we aim to use the same validate tasks that we use on the back end, as much as we can. Some validation requires database, and it doesn't make sense, but date validations and others. I strongly recommend, even if you're just using get, put, post, delete, try to share some of the types. Okay. Um, so after we add a task, some ceremony around error, some ceremony around JSON, updating a task, again, a lot of ceremonial code here that you'll probably try to refactor, but can't quite get around of. And another important thing is that when you're using these routes, the created date comes back as a string and not as a native date for JavaScript, which is, again, an annoyance that we are used to handling in our code. So far, it looks like a reasonable application, right? That's how most people did applications up until a year or two. So let's get back to our presentation. So when we review this, this has some advantages. It can work with any front end and any back end. So if you're using Vue, React, uh, Angular, Solid.js or Vanilla.js, whatever you like, this works. Any back end, you can use Express, Festify, Next, Nux, Nest, and all the other acronyms. We've seen how we share basic types, like the type of the task and the type of validation. We've seen how it uses standard REST API, which is very useful when you want to also expose an API for integrations. And it has a disadvantage. It is not protecting for spelling mistakes, so for me, that's a no-go. I could never write an application like that. And there's no protection from typing mistakes, which means if I send the wrong type, again, error prone, not for me. There's a lot of boilerplate code around JSON where you copy and paste it, and you copy it with the errors, with the vulnerabilities of security. Just a lot of, lot of code. 
And it also doesn't handle non-JSON types. And a lot of code, just like I said. Great. So the next step in our journey is TRPC. TRPC is end-to-end -end type safety APIs made easy. A guy named Alex created that a few years ago with the goal of making RPC, remote procedural calls, easier. And it uses a lot of Zod. How many of you use Zod? OK, cool. So it uses a lot of Zod. It likes Zod. So when we look at where TRPC fits in our stack, we take away the routes, we take away the fetch, and we replace it with a test router from TRPC. And that test router replaces the routes, replaces the fetch, and even adds a layer of API type validation, which is extremely useful, and we all love it. Now, of course, you can add it to normal HTTP, but you again need to work for that. So let's look at that in our code. So back to our project. We're going to head over to the TRPC route. And in here, we have the TRPC router. And we can see that it uses the service that we've defined before. And this is how we define the routes. This is, for example, the find method. It has an input of a Z object with show completed of type Boolean. OK, first of all, we see it's a type. It's not a string. It's harder to get wrong in terms of spelling mistakes, and it validates the types pretty well. And we define that it's a query, and it will call our service to find the tasks. And when it will do that, it will send a variable that is typed and correctly named. The same idea goes for insert, where we define the input. For the insert, for example, the title is mandatory, and the completed is optional. And for the update, both of them are optional. OK? And eventually delete. Pretty straightforward. A lot of z.object and z.string, but we got that defined. Let's go ahead and refactor the front-end code to use TRPC. So we're going to head over to our React component. And at the top, I'm going to add a small snippet. And in the snippet, you can see that we've imported TRPC. And the most important part is that we imported our task router that we've just seen as a type. Okay, which means the code itself is not imported in the front end, just the types are imported to help us with TypeScript. And let's replace the code to use this. So instead of doing the fetch over here, I'm going to say await task router dot find a dot query. And we can see that query gets a show completed that is Boolean. Okay? TRPC added the ability to share both the type name and the type itself. So that kind of helps me not make mistakes. And yeah, I don't actually want the await. I want the then. And yeah, I can delete all the way here. OK, let's see that it works. We'll refresh. And we got the tasks. Let's continue. Let's replace the insert. Await, task router, insert, mutate. And we'll send it the validated task, because we want to have front-end validation as well. I'm going to delete all the way up to here and paste. Great. So you see a lot less code, a lot less ceremonial code, a lot less error-prone code. So this is, in my view, a great improvement. Let's do another one here. Await, task router, update, mutate. ID is task ID, and data is completed. Everything is typed, everything autocompletes, less potential for error. So again, really, really like it. No need for the fetch anymore. And delete, task router, delete, mutate with the task ID. Great. Let's check, see that it works. I can add a new task. And uh, yes, let's also check out the network tab. I can add a new task. And we can see that it makes a post call. I can refresh and get the data. And we see that also refresh and getting the data, the find itself, is also a post call. So no standard REST HTTP. And if I check something is completed, we get, again, a post call to the update method, though, but again, not natural HTTP, not get, put, post, delete, and eventually delete, which is fun. Cool. So we've seen how TRPC does it. One more thing that's great about TRPC is that it can also transfer some non-JSON types. Not all of them, but at least dates. So now I can simplify this code. 
by deleting this and refreshing my browser. And this also works without me having to translate the string to date, which, again, as a lazy person and an error prone person, this kind of helps. So let's look back at TRPC. Obviously, it has some advantages. So it works with any JavaScript, front end and back end. So again, you can use it with Angular, Vue, React, Svelte, and anything else you like. And of course, Festify and Next, and Festify again, because Yoni was somewhere in the cloud. And we can share basic types between the front end and the back end. Okay? And we can also share the API arguments types, which we've seen was extremely valuable in this case. It also validates the API argument. So if we hijack the HTTP call and start changing it, Zod will protect us and let us know that things are wrong. And it also handles some uh, non-JSON types. And all the ceremonial code about wrapping in JSON and handling the errors and all of that just disappeared, which, again, I think is great. This actually reminds me that I want to show you something. Just before I move forward, let's head over to our source control and look at how much code was removed. Okay, so we've added this part at the top. But after that, if you're looking down at the code below, let me look at the code below, we can see how much code was deleted and how much the code now better articulates what's going on. So if previously there was a complicated fetch call, now there's just an insert call. A lot less ceremonial code, which I think is extremely valuable for the readability and maintainability of the code. So great advantages, but some disadvantages. First of all, it doesn't use standard REST API. So if you need to share these APIs with someone else, he needs to understand that you're not exactly using REST, and then it's a headache a little bit. It requires a verbose declaration of the API types, the Z object, Z string, Z boolean, everywhere to get that. And I actually try to refactor that and ended up having to be more verbose than I wanted to be. And then comes next. How many of you use next? OK. Again, too many. And so next. Next is the most popular meta framework for uh, React. It's actually what appears now in the React website when you say how to start with React. So that's OK that people use it. And they added server-side rendering that everybody wanted and loved. I'm not sure why. And server actions, which is what I'm going to talk about now. So when we look at server action in the context of our application schema, we still have the ORM, but the TRPC router can now be removed and be replaced by stretching the task service all the way to the front end. So if previously we had it be behind the HTTP route and then behind the TRPC router, now I can actually use it in the front end. It still handles authorization and validation. We just need to know that it doesn't do as much as we feel that it does, which means it doesn't do type validation, and you can quite easily inject whatever values you want to it. It kind of implies a safety that doesn't exist there. So you have to be mindful of that. And we'll see if we have enough time to demo that. But let's refactor the code to use server actions. So to use server actions, I'll go to our service. And all I need to do is put this nice little string on top. Use server. That's it. Kind of fun. Let's hold over to our front end. I can delete everything that is TRPC related. And instead of doing task router find query, I simply do find tasks. OK, now with the find task, we actually did something that I invite you all to do. The parameters that we send here is the Prisma task find many argument, OK, which means I can send it anything that is a valid Prisma query as a parameter to the server actions, giving me a lot of flexibility in the front end with very little cost. And because I'm later wrapping it with my filtering, okay, so I'm kind of protected against exposing data that shouldn't be exposed. Okay, so I think this is a nice technique. Let's use it. So in the front end, when someone wants to show completed, we're going to say where, or actually where, show completed, then everything, otherwise, completed false. And again, type safety and IntelliSense, which I love. And I'll also add an order by, created at, ascending. Remember, in the previous days, we need to create a lot of ceremonial code around being able to do server-side sorting, paging, filtering. And with server action and using that parameter type, a lot of ceremonial code is spared from you. So I think that's kind of great. Let's continue. A new task will simply be Insert task, OK, and probably should be awaited. An update is an update task. 
that should receive the ID as a parameter, and the object as the second parameter. Great. And delete should be delete task. Great. Let's check that our application still works. So obviously, reload, we see the data. And we no longer see a reasonable REST call. Currently, all the calls are 127.001. There's no meaningful route behind it, which is kind of annoying for me. We can update values. We can insert values. And we can delete values. So all the functionality works, but this is not normal REST API. So you cannot share this API with anyone else to use. But it's completely hackable. So if I go and add a new task, okay, and I'll do this nifty little trick of copy as CURL bash. And in any, in Postman or Thunder Client or whatever it is you want to use, you just import the CURL. I can send it, and it will insert the task. And then I can start meddling with the parameters. So if I don't have a decent server-side validation code after the server action, I will get errors that I never intended to get. In this case, I'm getting a Prisma error. OK, so even though it feels like they've done some magical things, they didn't, they didn't do enough magical things, and they kind of left us exposed. I was sure that this was going to be safe when I started working for this presentation. So this is something that you should be aware of. So back to our PowerPoint or presentation. Why do I call it PowerPoint all the time? So we've seen it here. And advantages. We can share basic types just like before. We can share API arguments, which is kind of cool. We have JSON and error handling built in, and it handles non-JSON types partially. You know, we can get a date back, but enums and classes are a bit more complex. A lot less boilerplate code, which is great. Uh, but the disadvantages, first of all, it's only relevant when you're using React and Next. Okay, so it's pretty specific. If you're using Angular, you have, maybe Analog does that, I'm not sure. Vue has Nuxt, Svelte has Veltkit. But still, really coupled between the UI and the backends that you can use. You cannot use it with Express or Festify or Nest or whatever it is you're using. Um, it doesn't use REST API, as we've seen. It has its own proprietary protocol. And it doesn't validate API argument, as we've seen. So next, let's talk about Remalt, the answer to everything. So Remalt is a, an open source project that Yoni and I started eight years ago. This was designed to solve these kind of problems, designed to simplify CRUD application development. So it includes a backend ORM, a zero boilerplate CRUD API routes that are inferred, not generated. Okay, they are inferred from your definition. Front-end type-safe API client, TypeScript entities as a single source of truth for your validation, authorization, and any logic that is entity related. Let me show you how it fits into our stack. So if previously we had Prisma and Task Service, we actually don't need that anymore. We define an entity. And that entity has the definition of the fields that we have and their types, and it handles authorization, validation, API type validation, and any other entity relevant concern. Okay? Let's uh, check it in the code. So in our project, next to our uh, task service, we actually have the task entity. And in our task entity, we have the field. Okay, we have the validation defined once, and the same validation code runs both, runs both on the front end and the back end. And we have the authorization. Only an admin can delete. And an admin user will see all the data, but a non-admin user will only see its own data. We can even define here which fields are updatable. For example, owner can never be updatable. Let's replace the code to use that. So I'm going to head over to our front end React app. I'm going to delete the import from task service, and I'm going to define a task repo, which is going to be a repo of type task. And notice that previously we've used the task type from Prisma. Now we'll actually use the task class for model task that we're using. So find task will become task repo.find with the same support for server side sorting, paging, and filtering, just without me having to write the service for that. We're going to say, task repo.insert, and we no longer need to call the validate function because that comes from the entity. Okay, it was defined in the field itself. So again, less code. Update, task repo.update, 
Just as simple, again, without me having to write the update function in the service, and delete. Yeah, not to await. Yay, error prone, did they say? Delete, great. And if we check out the network tab, we can see that it's all just standard REST API calls. Okay, so if you want to say show all, we can see how the get request changes. Okay, before it had completed false, now it has completed nothing. I can add a new task, a wrong task, and check out the network tab. Sorry? I get a validation without a network call. So the validation code for my entity runs both on the front end and the back end. Okay, and I can add a bigger task, and then I can update it and standard put, post, and delete calls. Okay, let's do a code comparison. So I'm going to head over to our spec. You probably all remember it, and let's try to do some comparison. So I'm going to put this. Uh, I'm going to put this at the bottom. Yes. Uh, yeah. Perfect. I'm going to take the task service and put it on that, and I'm going to take the task entity from Remalt and put it to the left, and give us some room. And let's let's review how the spec manifests in a code. So having an ID, title, completed, and owner was previously done in the schema file in the unique Prisma language. I don't need that anymore. Now it's in my TypeScript code, easy to read and follow. The filtering became a front-end concern. It just called the request with find, and I'm happy. The validation that I had to handle in task service, both on insert and on update, now exists in one line of code in the definition of the title. So whenever I will update it from the front end or the back end, the validation will automatically apply. And the effect that an admin can see all the rows is defined in the entity in one place, in the entity definition, whereas in the service, I had to define it both in the update and in the find. And probably I should have done that also for the delete, although I didn't need to do that in this demo. So a lot of code and a lot of concerns that are spread throughout your code are now existing in one single readable place. So, back to our slides. So, the advantages. It works with any front-end or back-end, React, Angular, Vue, whatever you like. It has end-to-end -end type safety. It shares the API argument types. It handles all the JSON stuff for you and also handles even complex non-JSON types, including classes and enums and other ideas. A lot less boilerplate code and a single source of truth for schema validation and authorization and disadvantages, because everyone needs to have some. Yet another JavaScript library. Something else we need to learn and adopt, but hey, you know what? If we don't want to have JavaScript libraries, we could have used um, Laravel, where there's only one thing that can do things, or Django, where there's one solution. But since we're all JavaScript developers, we are here for the ecosystem, for the richness of the library, so I'll take the disadvantage. Um, Remalt fields within your existing stack. You can use it with anything on the front end, anything on the back end, almost any database, Node, Dino, Ban, Server, Serverless, you know, Vercel, Heroku, Azure, AWS, whatever you like. Um, it has a lot more features. Based on those entities, we can expose GraphQL and OpenAPI. There's a lot of uh, um, lifecycle hooks and you can use and dive into those relationships, migrations, uh, cool admin panels that if I had more time I would show you. And if you don't like decorators, you can work without decorators. If you don't like TypeScript, you can work with JavaScript. This one is for you. And this is kind of a comparison of what we talked about. I have like 20 seconds, so just absorb this. Okay? What routes gives us, what TRPC gives us, what server actions give us, and this good thing over here. Um, I invite you all to visit Rimal.dev. Give us a star. We love those stars. And we have tutorials on our website when you can, in about an hour and a half, start from NPM init and finish in an application that is deployed on the cloud with Postgres database, validation, authorization, and pretty much everything else around it with React, Angular, Vue, Svelte, SvelteKit, and Next. Thank you so much.